A Christian critique of Christian America is what I want to focus in on today. It's the title of an essay by Stanley Hauerwas in the book Christian Existence Today, Essays on Church, World, and Living in Between. Now, this book was published, it feels like a little bit, yes, like uh, it's a fairly like old book from 1988 when um, this kind of thing was really a big deal, this issue of prayer in the public schools. That was a really big deal, um, and it was in the news all the time. The moral majority was, uh, was a pretty active force and the Christian right generally was calling for prayer to be put back into the schools, although it seems to me that, um, you know, American his in American history, um, pretty much throughout, you know, the history of the public school system, there have been places where that type of thing was done frequently and then other places where it wasn't. So I guess my point there is just that it wasn't a uniform practice. But, um, in the end, he says he can't do it, uh, not because he doesn't think that people ought to be exposed to some degree of, re of Christian religion, but rather that his view is, his view is definitely that um, if it were put in the public schools, it would be so watered down and so inaccurate because it, you know, any prayer that was done would be basically um, the lowest common denominator, you know, what everybody could accept, which of course will never happen. That's why it hasn't happened. But but if it could happen, it, he thought it would do more harm than good. And furthermore, he reveals himself in this chapter to just be against any sort of civil religion. He says at the beginning, he says, for the theological reasons, for theological reasons, um, I still cannot support school prayer that I cannot puts me at odds with the social strategy of most Christians, both liberal and conservative in America. Now that statement was um, a hard one to figure out because if he's writing in 1988, or like in the mid 80s anyway, uh, the, you know, the idea of there being a sort of liberal Christian view maybe wasn't as strong a notion as it is today. And for the most part, the people who were arguing for any degree of religion in the public square were um, those from the right. So that makes you wonder, well, where, where is Stanley Hauerwas coming from here? Um, now, he then explains that American Christians have always kind of generally been activist in their orientation. And this is true, like from the beginning, the, the founding of the country, some of the founders were just not believers at all. Many were deists, um, and some were, you know, more traditional Christians. But one thing that most of them agreed on was that a certain amount of religion in society, in the general population, would be good and maybe even necessary for maintaining a democracy. Um, because a democracy requires people to be responsible, to think about their fellow citizens when they make decisions, not just to, um, you know, think about their own interests, but everybody else's, follow the law and stuff like that. So there's, there was this agreement right from the founding that Christianity could translate into the public square and actually ought to be promoted to a certain extent by the government. Okay. Now, I think Stanley Hauerwas thinks that was, you know, like a big mistake, and it's not, not a mistake that started with the American founding, but the American founding kind of repeated the mistake. Um, he mentions Jerry Falwell and the moral majority. This is kind of the group that, you know, was most predominant at the time in the Christian right. But he also mentions the Rawlsian Christian left. So this helped define a little bit more. What does he mean by the Christian left? And why does he lump the two together to a certain extent here? And it seems as though it's because, you know, the Christian left identifies democracy with Christianity and tends to identify certain democratic outcomes as they see, you know, that or desire them to be as Christian. Um, John Rawls is who he's referring to here with the social contract theory that Rawls 
developed saying that you know every individual if they were under a veil of ignorance would would choose to have a type of government that provided people with support you know if they were down if they didn't have enough that everybody would be guaranteed a certain minimum level of existence um and any degree of inequality would have to be justified by the least uh, being lifted up by it and so on and so forth. But basically Rawls's um, view is a sort of liberal, democratic, socialist view at the most, okay? Um, and so both the moral majority and the Rawlsians and the Christian left that adopted, in his view, the sort of Rawlsian liberal view of the good life, um, had in common that they saw the um, U.S. government as a vehicle for promoting their idea of what the good life is from a Christian perspective. And he would argue, I think, that even the secularists who don't believe that they are believers, their principles still are heavily influenced by the Christian principles as they've sort of filtered through Western um, civilization. And so they themselves are a sort of secular version of the Christian left. Um, and so, you know, there is no real, there is no real escape from the influence of a certain type of Christianity from Hauerwas' perspective. But that type of Christianity that translates into some sort of civil religion on the right or the left in his view, is just wrong-headed. It doesn't get the religion um, correct. He says, we need to appreciate why Christian theologians and ethicists in America, especially since the 19th century, have assumed that Christianity and democracy are integrally related, because he doesn't think they are, and there's multiple reasons for that. Okay. Um, but he basically says that the identification that is putting Christianity and democracy together and then putting democracy with America, putting those two things together in our minds, is something that the Christian right and Christian left both share and that there's multiple mistakes being make, made here. First of all, that, that Christianity and democracy are identified. Okay, There is no... Um, there is no necessity for Christianity to be expressed as democracy because Christianity as a religion is just something else other than the way that we are governed by our secular authorities, okay? He says, the, but the primary subject of Protestant and Catholic Christian ethics in America has been America. And what he means by that is that believers across that spectrum in America have tended to ask the question not what does it mean to be a Christian in the case of the Christian majority of course what does it mean to be a member of a church they have asked more what does it mean to be an American because they have so closely conjoined um, Christianity with being an American and being in, in um, to support democracy basically Okay, so uh, there is no real reason why these things have to go together, and indeed, his, in his view, they don't. Um, but he makes the point that when you adopt this idea of sort of watered-down Christianity as a civil religion, and you sort of um, you adopt patriotism as a chief means of describing or, or expressing your civil religion, that basically you are you are saying, I am a part of the majority, right? That's a, that's a position, the civil religion is a position that the majority can get behind because it is so watered down and it is so much about government, about secular things like, you know, taxes and, and you know, budgets and, and war and, and uh, welfare. It, all of these things, like it's all about that, right? And these are things that we can argue about, but we also can um, hope to find some common ground on through through the you know democratic process. Okay, um, so we can say I am a member of the majority, right? And Harawas really wants to say that Christians have never been in the majority. Okay. Um, 
Now, just to sum up here what we where we've gotten so far, and then I'll come back to that point. He says, my refusal to support prayer in schools is because I find myself outside that tradition of making American democracy as close as possible to a manifestation of God's kingdom. That's not, in his view, what Christianity is about. It's not to make America and American democracy as close to, as possible to a manifestation of God's kingdom. He says, that I do so is because I do not believe that the universalism that is intrinsic to Christian faith is carried by the culture of the West but instead is to be found first and foremost in the church. So that kind of explains a little bit of what we were talking about last time. How are was thinks that the true, you know, point where we could possibly agree is in the Christian religion. Now that makes him in the modern parlance a sectarian. He is making a case for the Christian religion being that which is best. This is such a controversial statement now and yet it's sort of like implicit in every religion, you know, so it's just the it's just the way it is, and so he's not shying away from that. Um, and whereas we in the United States tend to think that liberal democracy, which is what we think we have, um, is that universal expression of Christianity, which we then hope and you know sometimes actively but press upon the rest of the world. Um, that everybody will eventually have, right? This is the whole, you know, neoconservative agenda of, of the past, you know, um, that uh, got the United States into the, the war in Afghanistan, Iraq and Afghanistan, and so on and so forth. Um, so this is just false, you know. It's, it's a, in his view, it's a path leading off the track, that the only point of maybe universalism is in is in God. Now, he bothers some people because he is, I guess he, he would probably object to this, but let's say he is sectarian. He makes a case for Christianity specifically. Yeah, I even find that somewhat, un I struggle with that. Um, but um, he is basically saying, if at, at the very least we can take away, you know, religion or Christianity in, in his argument is that point of true um, universality and the other is not because you just can't pursue this successfully in truth um, through your political activity. So he goes back in this essay to Emperor Constantine. I mentioned in the last one, Constantinianism. And that, that's a term that, that refers back to Emperor Constantine, who, um, at least as lore has it, in 312 AD, um, converted to Christianity because um, he saw, he was in battle and he saw this, this cross vision up in the sky and with the promise that, you know, if he put, if everybody put the cross on their shield in this battle, that um, that they would prevail, and they did prevail, and you know, so Roman the Romans prevailed, and so um, this became the official Roman religion. Not, I don't, I don't think it was exactly that date, but not long after. Okay, so after Rome adopted the Christian religion, it became ipso facto the the like religion of the majority by law. But, but that didn't mean that most people in it actually cared a whole lot about it, okay? They were gonna be Christians whether they liked it or not, legally, but many of them probably remained, remained pagan. Many of them didn't care. Um, many of them were just really bad Christians. I mean, it just goes without saying. And so, you know, Hartwas's point is, again, look, you know, um, civil religion is a watered down religion. It, it actually diminishes and actually destroys religion because it stands for so little and it's fused with the state. It becomes really just another word for patriotism or nationalism. Um, but real, real Christianity is always gonna be, in his view, a minority position because it asks so much. People have to be, if they're gonna do it and be it, they have to do it right and, and try to be right. And, and it takes some doing. Uh, it takes a continual lifetime struggle. And, um, and, you know, as we know, oftentimes Christians are persecuted um, and they're not, certainly not alone 
lot of minority religions have been persecuted, right? Um, because they refuse to basically bow down to uh, power, to secular earthly power. This is what gets them in trouble. So, but, you know, the mistake was made when Christianity adopted liberal democracy um, as the universal Christian stance, in his view. And supporting the liberal regime became the highest religious purpose. And again, he is basically saying, yes, the religious right are the most sort of like currently visible, you know, manifestation of that. But Woodrow Wilson would be another one. He doesn't mention Wilson. But, you know, anybody like that who kind of put all, you know, notions of justice and goodness and rightness into the vision of how they wanted um, the U.S. government to run society and the economy. And so he, he just disagrees with that. Now, like throughout this chapter, he mentions repeatedly John Howard Yoder, who's a pacifist Christian theologian who died in 1997. Um, he had a tremendous influence on um, Harawas, apparently. Um, and though he doesn't agree with him 100%, he draws a lot from him. Um, and so he mentions him here when he says, I am convinced that this habit of thought, which Yoder calls Constantinianism, so it came from Yoder, must be given up. We must give it up. Otherwise, we Christians remain caught in the same habits of thought and behavior that implicitly or explicitly assume that insofar as America is a democracy, she is a Christian. We know that he, th he, he doesn't think America is a democracy because he says, you know, basically democracy is kind of a fantasy. It's, it's, a, it's a myth. Right. And it always has been, whether it's, you know, it was ancient Athenian democracy, uh, which was flat out majority rule, or whether it's representative liberal democracy. He says in this chapter, essentially, you know, the elites always rule. Um, they always rule in a democracy. That if you look at wh who's really in power, it's always going to be the elites. It was an ancient democracy and it is now. So there's that. But even if America was a democracy for real, in its purest sense, the idea that um, insofar as America was a democracy, she would be a Christian democracy or a Christian government, is just thinking wrongly. There is no such thing as Christian government. Those two things are, are different, okay? They, they, they speak to different, um, different concerns. They do different things. Um, and, you know, in his heart of hearts, he's not so much, he's not a separationist. That's not where I, where I want you to think he's going. Rather, he thinks that Christianity calls people to be something much more than a good citizen, whatever that means at the moment to them. Okay, um, that it that calls for much more, and so to basically say that that's what it requires is to make it false, to falsify it, to falsify it, to water it down, to in effect destroy it. It calls for people to believe in something higher than that, namely God. Then it calls on them to believe the Christian story, so the role of Christ. And it calls on people to cooperate with each other in the church. He, he places a big emphasis on the church as like an organization of true, um, you know, fellowship and support for each other. Now, we've yet to see exactly what that means for him, and I'm hoping that we do. But the church is more than just a place that you go on Sunday to hear a good sermon from Hauerwas's perspective. But you can't get any of that from the government. He says, Christians need to, quote, make peace with our minority situation and unmask the myth of Christendom, which wasn't true even when it was believed. Okay. So um, Yoder, I suppose, and Harawas don't believe there ever was such a thing as Christendom. That's a misnomer, right? Um, so anyway, you can now see, hopefully, how Harawas's way of thinking does go along with a certain type of Christian anarchism. I've yet to figure out whether uh, Harawas himself would call himself that. Probably not is kind of my feeling, but maybe. But it doesn't really matter because the question is, what are the implications of his thought and what can be done with them? And 
and how can some of his ideas be used to develop ideas that may work now, right now, in a given situation, whether he went there or not. So I'm really excited by like what I'm what I'm reading from Howard Wass. I like it. Um, this was from that book. I already referenced it. Um, there's a section towards the end that's all about this topic. So the next one is virtue in public. So I'll probably cover that. All right. Well, I hope you guys have a good week. Thank you. Bye.